Welcome to the Garlic Marketing Show. I've got an incredible entrepreneur with a fantastic background as our guest today. We're going to talk about growing big businesses, pivoting businesses, and law and legal parts of business. But before we get started with Mr. Larry Pino, this podcast is brought to you by StoryCruise.com. You know, video is no longer an option and your number one a video asset are your video case stories, not testimonials. It's your most powerful web marketing weapon. Story Cruise is the ultimate resource to learn how to 4X your sales and your marketing campaigns using video case stories, as well as find those videographers that know marketing. Just go to storycruise.com slash case story. All right, Mr. Larry Pino, thank you for being on. I am going to, before you even say anything, I'm going to talk a little, I don't usually do this much of an intro, but you know, you've uh, had 5,500 speaking in, in presentations to over 1 million people, 140 television show talk shows, written nine books, um, sold and incubated 80 different businesses in eight sectors, and, you know, and also 16,000 different manners as an attorney. So, um, you know, you've, you've done a few things. <laughs> I'm excited to have you on. And I, I want you to go through every single case you've ever done. No, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for being on. We're excited to have you here. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted and honored that you've invited me to be on. Uh, Ian. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, your road to becoming both an attorney and an entrepreneur, because we were talking about beforehand, just there's a lot of attorneys that are wealthy. It doesn't make them great entrepreneurs. How'd you realize you want to do both? You know, it's funny because, uh, so I was going to, I was at Notre Dame. So, um, and, and honestly, <laughs> tell you what, I'll even start before college. So I got my first summer job at Our Lady of Lords, which was a hospital in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, we were living, mom and dad, uh, family was living in New Jersey at the time. And, you know, my, the, the, the girlfriend that I had as a junior in high school, was guilting me uh, into the fact that I wasn't going to have a summer job because she had like worked every summer and I'm saying, I don't want to say I don't want a job. And so she kind of guilted me into it. So I had my very first job at Our Lady of Lords Hospital. It was in the, wow. uh, the x-ray department uh, in the basement of the hospital, which was about, you know, 40 floors, you know, just, just two floors above hell. And you go down the elevator, you know, for like 40 floors to the basement and you get out and there's a nun uh, waiting for you on the other side of the elevator. You know, she's got the pointed hat and she's the nun and all that. And then you get put into a room that has the x-ray file cabinets. And your job is to take x-rays and to file them all day long. You got a 15 minute break in the morning, a 15 minute break in the afternoon and 30 minutes for lunch. Now, since you're like, God knows where you are below sea level, you have no idea 15 minutes to just go upstairs to the to the snack area and to come down. Good luck. I mean, you'll barely yeah. make it in 15. And by the way, you had to punch a clock for 15 minute breaks, right? So I spent about two, three days after that, I came home and I said, you know, I'll finish this summer job, but I am never going to work for somebody the rest of my life. I'm <laughs> never going to work for somebody. And I didn't know at the time, because I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. I just knew that I was not going to work for anybody. I was going to be self-employed. So when I then went to college, I went to Notre Dame, um, I immediately, I, you know, I was a philosophy major. And being a philosophy major on the one side, I'm looking for like ways to make money on the other. And I did all kinds of small businesses, all kinds of things in college, including mock stock market competition. Just always knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work for myself. In whatever, I didn't know what it was going to be, but I wanted to work for myself. Um, and then I decided that, you know, I think I'm going to go to law school. And when I went to law school, it wasn't to start a law practice. It was to run a business. So I finished, graduated from New York University Law School, NYU, and then went home to Orlando, as you know, came down to Central Florida, which is where my parents had moved, and then immediately went into the sporting goods business with my dad. And we built up our very first business was a chain of nine retail stores and what was the largest um, wholesale athletic distributorship, uh, institutional distributorship in the state of Florida. And we subsequently sold it when dad decided that he was going to retire. But by that point, three years into the sporting goods business, I decided to practice law. And I never looked back. I always have done businesses and I have always practiced commercial law. Wow. 
And that's, I mean, and how do you balance those two? Obviously, because I mean, it's, it, it, you have to switch mindsets. You have to deal with clients while running your business. How, how do you balance that? You know, I really don't. I, it's not so much a balance. It's not a balance issue for me. Because it really, to me, I know it's strange that it sounds strange, um, but it really is just integrated. Because when I'm hearing, I'm hearing a client talk, I'm, I am hearing myself talk. And I am just mentally processing what the situation is, but I'm wearing not a lawyer's hat, I'm wearing a principal's hat. I'm wearing his or her hat as the business person, as the entrepreneur, but I'm looking at it from both the business point of view, their point of view, as well as from my point of view as a lawyer. And I, if anything, identify, you know, tell you what, based on your circumstances, here's what I might suggest you do from a business standpoint. Um, uh, although, you know, from a legal standpoint, that might be a little bit problematic. Um, on the other hand, you know, your exposure is not substantial. You know, so I'm actually processing it through both sides of the same coin. And they really are just fully integrated in my mind. That's fantastic. Interesting because I, I mean, usually you've got, if you, you either have a full blooded entrepreneur who, you know, skirt, I mean, not, not that people do stuff illegal, it's just that they don't pay attention to that stuff till it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or you have an attorney who really doesn't think that they need to pay attention to the entrepreneurship point until they're trapped in, in their law practice. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really cool. So, you know, when you're, you know, you, you obviously you've done a lot of businesses and when you're getting started with this, because there's different stages of business and there's different mindsets, what mindset are you in when you start a business and how does that evolve as you grow into, like you were talking about, about a $250 million a year business? Yeah. So, you know, that really did start off, um, you know, maybe the best way that I can describe that. So I had a client at the time, his name was Mr. Khan. This was early on in my, in my law practice. Uh, Mr. Khan is the guy that sold, you might've come across his name, Ian. He sold Shaq O'Neal, his house. Oh. So, it, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Khan were living in that house and Shaq O'Neal loved it and wanted to buy it. And it's the very one that, that Shaq bought. And I think it's now for sale uh, for some, you know, ungodly amount of money that Shaq continued to expand the home. And uh, so I did the closing in my office in downtown Orlando. And I had everybody there. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, I've never done a closing that had like 50 people there, but everybody <laughs> was Jack O'Neill. So, cause that's that, those were the days in which he was really popular in central Florida, right? So um, I, I did that. And then afterwards, um, after everybody finally left and all that, Mr. Khan and I were going down the steps um, of my office at 24 South Orange at that time. And I didn't realize that there were cameras out front. Uh, the cameras of ABC, CBS, NBC, whatever, you know, and, and, and the interviewer comes up with a microphone, sticks a microphone in Mr. Khan's face and says, how did you make so much money? And he just looked at her because he was a very modest man. And he looked at her and he said one t-shirt at a time. And uh, because he had a chain of retail stores and I met Mr. Khan when he had moved here from England and opened up his very first store, a uh, t-shirt shop in, on International Drive. Uh -huh. And you know, hundreds of millions of dollars later, he was a multimillionaire with uh, great big buildings on, uh, on International Drive and a hotel and a restaurant and all that. Uh, how do you make money? One t-shirt at a time. So, so when, you're, you know, when you're thinking about a business, you're thinking about a business that you can seize onto and that you can build. And you know, the more focus you have on that one particular business, the more opportunity you have to make it successful. You know, you talked about you know, that I have had 80 businesses in my career, which is true, but it's really only been in about 12 to 18 business segments. Um, and you know, many of them are primarily brands within those segments. But those were segments that one at a time I knew well, and one at a time I had continued to expand based on knowing it well. Um, and so when you're, when you're taking a look at it, it's important that you create you know, passion for what you're doing with perseverance in terms of really seeing how it works. 
identifying what I call those levers that allow you to really scale it. And then once you've identified those levers, levers man, just you, you just go like crazy. You just really learn how to just simply turn those levers. That's interesting. So I'm assuming marketing is one of those levers um, and sales and marketing. How do you go about identifying that and testing it? Because, you know, I think one of the things that people, mistakes I see in marketing, you know, working in the agency for 10 years and owning it and working with tons of businesses is too often they don't invest enough time into marketing or like a, sp a specific marketing branch, but you have to test them, but you also have to know when to let them go or when they're going to work. How do you go about figuring out what works? Primarily, it's, it is really data-driven. It's uh, marketing is really data-driven. And what you have to do is you need the discipline to be able to identify what you're doing, to be, to, uh, to, to be able to quantify what you're doing. How much does it cost? And then it's just, a, it's a math game. You know, I spent this amount of money doing this particular thing, producing this many leads that converted to this many personal tours, in my case, when it comes to senior living or, um, you know, personal interviews uh, and, um, and this many conversions into a sale. And every single one of those has a cost attached to them. You know, the cost of the lead, the cost of that, blah, 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 blah. And everyone has a revenue amount attached to them. So what you do is you identify the particular thing that you're doing and you establish what those cost metrics are and those as the denominator and those revenue metrics are as the numerator. And you then begin the opportunity to evaluate what is the most productive or the more productive of the different things you do. It is a data driven science. And the only real way that you can really do that is to be able to measure those costs and the right. revenue. And yeah, and the revenue, exactly. Um, and I, it's, it's amazing how few businesses actually pay attention to that and connect them. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they, they might connect the cost of a lead, but not the actual revenue. Um, right. so, so, you know, as that evolves, you know, because there's a lot of metrics that you can pay attention to, especially these days and tons of metrics. How are, are you deciding on one or two metrics to start out? Are you three metrics? Are you going through the whole gamut of metrics? Well, I think it kind of depends upon obviously the business that you're in. So I mentioned just before we started that I'm now the, you know, the CEO, the founder of a company called Tuscan Garden Senior Living. Mm -hmm. So we do assisted living and we do memory care. Um, and we're just now beginning to do independent living uh, in our communities. Uh, because of the previous experience I had um, with a pretty substantial uh, direct response sales and marketing company that did primarily sales events, um, mm -hmm. marketed uh, attendees to sales events and then sold at sales events. I was just very focused on direct response. So I began the process um, in going into senior living with direct response. Love it. Uh, and the, the truth of the matter is, it doesn't, you know, direct response uh, in senior living doesn't translate. Oh. Uh, it, it is very difficult. You know, if you're talking about your mother or you're talking about your father, and you're talking about where, what kind of community you would want them to live in, um, you're, you're not gonna be particularly responsive uh, to a direct response piece. You're gonna be very responsive to um, word of mouth. You're gonna be very responsive to social media. You're certainly gonna be responsive to what you see uh, on websites and on video. You mentioned video in your sponsorship uh, communication. Video is incredibly important. We use video incessantly. I have a full-time full associate here in the corporate office whose full-time job is social media. And that's all she does is she gets you know, photos from the community, sometimes stills and sometimes video and posts them on social media, all of the social media. And inevitably there's a caption or a storyline or something. And, you know, they're, they're, they're doing the Super Bowl party um, or they're, uh, they're visiting Barcelona, uh, which was uh, what we did just the other day in terms of a food fest. Uh, and all of these activities that are designed to display what? Designed to display signature dining and signature programming and signature activities and uh, 
fun environment that I would want to be in, that I would want my mother to be in. Uh, you can't do that with direct response. You know, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't, you can't do that with direct mail or with a newspaper ad. But I spent a fortune on direct response advertising before I figured it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, it really does depend on the business, but it has also evolved over time. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that there are any number of consumer marketers right now that still use sort of traditional direct response couponing and all that kind of thing in order to be able to generate revenue. Um, but we have just more than anything gravitated towards um, uh, any type of online delivery of marketing messages. Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, I, I love that you've started with direct response and so few companies do it like the, but it's, it's a great place to start and figure out what doesn't work because it gives you metrics right away. Um, you know, and that's one of the things we talk about all the time is that your video people should know the elements of direct response. Your marketers should know the elements of direct response. But do you bring any of that direct response over? Is, are there any elements of direct response still in your marketing? All of the above. So, so when you, when you take a look at it, so for example, the, there's, there's a difference between what I call the traditional direct response, uh, which would be, you know, letters and postcards and newspaper ads and all that. Um, that's traditional, but you know, online is still direct response. Um, yep. You're just using a different medium for it. So the discipline of the traditional marketer, not the institutional marketer that uses message advertising. The problem with message advertising is it doesn't have a call to action. And because it doesn't have a call to action, you can't count anything. You can't count leads, you can't count costs, you can't count conversions. So it doesn't do anything. So Institutional is just kind of like way out there. But if you take the discipline of direct response marketing and you attach that discipline to what are online deliverables at this point of marketing messages, it's the same exact concept. You know, it's going to be, I'm spending this amount of money. I had this many impressions. I had this many leads. I had this many presentations and I had this many sales. Uh, and once you do that, you're going to get a cost, a revenue and a ratio. And that's all you need. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I think that that level of measurement is important. Now, there are some, when you're doing social media, obviously, you, you, there's some variables that come in there. Yeah. Are you aggregating all that? Are you, because a single post is, sometimes will take off, but it might not lead to money. No, 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 no. Right. Yes. So, you're definitely aggravating. Uh, aggravating. Yeah. You're definitely aggregating. <laughs> the actual, yeah, you're aggregating all of the content. And there has to be an expectation as to the investment. But, you know, so too, you know, and that's true in social media, it's true online. Less so when you start talking about paid, but, you know, paper, pay per click and, and uh, you know, those, those types of keyword marketing. But, but certainly in social media, you have to be prepared to invest a certain amount of money before you start seeing results coming in. Um, but that's really, that holds true really in any number of different, even in traditional marketing. I mean, in the company that I talked about, sales and marketing company, um, we did um, we did a combination of newspaper, infomercial, direct response, and then at a later time we started doing uh, a significant amount online. Um, but but you know if you if you go into a market, uh, and we went into a lot of markets every single week. But if you go into a market and you run one newspaper ad, it's like okay, but <laughs> you know, our experience was unless you invest in three to five full page newspaper ads, you're not going to get any type of efficiency. Same thing with infomercials. You know, I suppose you could go into a market with $10,000 worth of infomercials. Uh, but, you know, unless we spent in um, mid sized city like a Kansas City, unless we spent fifty-five to $65,000 on that infomercial campaign, forget about it. You know, you weren't going to get the type of response you want. If you're going to go into LA, if you didn't spend $120,000, uh, you know, you weren't going to get any type of response. So I guess my point is when you're talking about social media, you don't need to spend that kind of money at all. I mean, I'm talking much tinier money, but there has to be some threshold because if you don't have a threshold of some marketing investment uh, in, in the social media, uh, you're not going to be able to get that, you know, to get that uh, uh, response rate that you're looking for. Yeah, that's such an important point. I talk about it all the time, and I'm glad you're talking about this because what it's there's a 
it's an evolutionary biology term called punctuated equilibrium, but it's people think that we're going straight up and it's like, oh, I pay, spend $1, you get $1 return, I spend $10. But no, you find that point where it's all of a sudden, boom, you're getting the returns, right? Yeah. By the way, the concept of punctuated equilibrium is also applied to any number of disruptive technologies. Mm -hmm. Because in the area of disruptive technologies, that's exactly what you get. There is a consolidation. You know, you have this, uh, this equilibrium point where you have uh, this... Um, um, you know, this sort of consolidation of technique or a particular technology. And then all of a sudden you have an explosion in it, which is what occurs when you're dealing with uh, disruptive technologies. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's where people don't realize that it's, it's not this gradual thing. It's I, you're chugging along and all of a sudden it's boom. And uh, I've seen it in marketing, you see it in business. Um, so, you know, you're looking at data and obviously you've scaled businesses and people love to hear about scaling businesses. Uh, you know, is that, is that a, I see the data all of a sudden jump, let's put the pedal to the gas. Is that what, is that how you decide when to scale? Yeah. Well, the, it really kind of goes back to the, the blocking and tackling tough to scale a business unless you know how the metrics work. Um, if I spend $10 and I produce 20, or I produce 30. Uh, and we used to look for a one to three ratio. So, um, you know, so I spend $100 and I'm looking for $300 of revenue as an example. The first thing that I have to have control over is that. I have to have control over that particular metric. How much do I spend to get that much revenue? And that's the ratio that I was referring to earlier. So that's the first component of this thing, right? So now, once you understand that, then your second question is, okay, is that now something that I can scale? In other words, so do I have the ability, if I'm spending 100 to get three, do I have the ability to spend 1,000 to get 3,000? And do I have the market that if I spend 1,000, that I have the market that's going to be absorbing whatever product or service it is that I'm offering? so that it becomes $3,000. And that, so you then, you go from, you know, $100 to $1,000, $10,000. And so you begin the process of scaling uh, in that particular way, both horizontally and vertically. However, the most, the, but, but, but the point that you're commenting on, which is the real comment is, none of that is relevant unless you know the viability of the underlying proof of concept. You need to have an understanding of what that ratio is before you can even attempt to scale. And, and I'm not going to tell you, by the way, that I always had that type of discipline and control. I mean, my first several businesses, I was all about scaling before, <laughs> before, before I had the proof of concept. Um, bad things happen. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. Yeah, I was about to ask you that, too, because... You, you know, we talk a lot about because we run EO Entrepreneur Operating System with Gina Wickman, you know, Gina Wickman's thing. And we talk about visionaries and integrators and the visionary is always thinking about big and scale and the integrator is always thinking about the numbers and that person that really day to day. And you sound like you're both now, Are you, do you, but it, it sounds like earlier on you're the visionary. Are you both a visionary and an integrator or do you have someone else that really is paying attention to that numbers? And you know, just, I, I really am pretty on the line there. I really always have been on the line. I mean, I've always been, um, you know, they always used to, you know, my, 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 my emails have always been vision at, you know, whatever it is, vision at such and such in terms of being able to, you know, I tusk, you know, I conceptualize Tuscan gardens with a piece of paper. Um, and so there's always that vision component, but, but I will also tell you that, you know, vision without an understanding of the implementational component, uh, doesn't really get you very far. So you either have to have it yourself or you just simply have to, um, you know, bring it into your, to your organization. And what is your vision for Tuscan Gardens? This is, it, this is super interesting to me. I and mean, we've worked with, you know, it, and I've worked with several communities throughout the years and big people and small people. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of them are, it's a dollars and cents thing. But when you speak of vision, that's really cool to me because I think a lot of people don't have that when it comes to those types of communities. You know, I think that if you really wanted to get a sense of the vision, the best way to do that, Ian, is just take a look at our website. It's just all over the place. That TuscanGardens.com, our vision for it, 
uh, is exactly, um, you know, it's creating a senior living community in, in my mother's image and likeness. Um, that's really what it's about. Love it. I love it. Um, very cool. And then I want to talk a little bit about the commercial, the law side of it. Cause you talked to me before about like, Hey, I think about the law side of it. What do you think are crucial legal ideas, legal terms, legal ideas that every entrepreneur should know that most don't? You know, I, th I think that most of the time where I see the, where I see the business people and entrepreneurs tend to make mistakes is that they, they tend to short circuit um, just Again, not to use the cliche again, but the blocking and tap tackling. I just did a deal, not did a deal, but I just had an email exchange, for example, in a client with a client uh, in Maine, just literally 15 minutes before I got on the uh, on the podcast, and they're 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 asking me to produce documents, and uh, and it's a wonderful people. They're they're practitioners. They're medical practitioners. Um, they're wonderful people, and I say. Okay, glad glad to do it. Um, do you know what the what the deal terms are? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, we've kind of talked about it. You know, we've we've talked about what the deal would look like. Okay, do you have a meeting of the minds as far as what the deal looks like? Um, because it's not tough, especially not with emails. You know, dear Ian. I've really enjoyed our conversation. So let me use this as an opportunity to memorialize the transaction or the deal that we think that we're going to be doing. You're gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. Here's how we're gonna share the revenue. Here's how long it's gonna work. In other words, it's just a bunch of bullet points. The lawyering of it, the contracts, the transactions, the formalization of the process, that's easy, that comes later. The real issue is, do you have a meeting of the minds? Do you both agree? Um, because if you don't have a meeting of the minds, I, I literally, I wrote, you know, I, we do quite a bit of securities work. So I, I, I literally was contracted by another medical health professional in the Midwest to do a Reg D, to do a, to do a securities offering for, for him. I did based on his representations because I, I didn't know better. I, I thought that he had the deal done. He just wanted me to do the securities work. So I put together the Reg D based on what he told me. And um, you know it was a, a substantial effort to put this together for him. I think, I don't know how much he spent on it. I don't know, 10, $12,000 uh, for this Reg D. And when I came right down to it, I'm talking about the deal, the way that he expressed it to me. And I'm saying, okay, so I need to now have the transactional documents because we need to be showing them as exhibits to the offering. There were no transactional documents. They hadn't been done yet. And then on top of that, that's not the bad part. I could have done that. The bad part is his concept, which was that his fund would have a first mortgage interest a first mortgage interest on land. That's what he understood the fund to be. And that's what these investors who, by the way, had already invested in the fund, had understood it to be. When we actually get on the other side with the other person who's gonna be in that transaction, we find out that number one, no, it's not a first mortgage. There's going to be a construction loan. This is going to have to be subordinated. The percentage interest rate that he was talking about was significantly less than the percentage interest rate, which the investors thought they were going to get. There was a tiny back end, but it was only tiny. And it was a major, it was a major risk. It completely shifted the risk profile. So I use that as an example about the fact that there's nothing wrong with the fact that this guy was entrepreneurial and wanted to do this, but he put the cart before the horse. And it's really just extremely easy to structure a transaction. You start with an email, you solidify the primary material points of the deal. You then get yourself a contract that identifies that. And then you begin the process of putting it through. Um, my sense of it, depending upon how experienced the entrepreneurs are, if, they, if they're lacking at anything, they lack uh, an understanding of the value of those initial those initial portions 
of the uh, business. Yes, it's interesting. Yeah, because it's like everyone's so, like you said, the horse before the car, everyone's so gung-ho, everyone's so excited at that first part. And they're kind of not really, they're, they're dancing around the, the major points and not yeah. solidifying those points. And, and by the way, in the same exact way, Ian, you know, you have, you have people who talk to me um, and they usually, I mean, now it's, it's just, especially in our Zooming world, um, you know, they're, they're not coming in to see me in person because they don't, they don't have to. Um, so, but, you know, it's a conversation that talks about, you know, setting up entities and setting up companies. And it's like, okay, I mean, you know, that's, that, that's easy to do. Everything is online now, really easy to do. Why don't you talk to me about the business? To tell me about the business. How is the business going to work? So, or how is the business working? You know, what are your primary uh, challenges in the operation of the business and things like that? Um, I closed on a um, uh, closed on a deal for both a client and a friend about six months ago, and um, I specifically told he bought the business. And I specifically told him, I, I, as part of the due diligence, he got a lot of financials and so forth. And it was kind of like, and I assisted him on what he needed to get. But part of the due diligence is, have you talked to the workers? No, the seller doesn't want me to talk to the workers. And I, I don't want to identify what the industry is. But, you know, you know, the seller is very uncomfortable with me talking. The, 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 the workers don't know that the business is being sold and all that kind of thing. So I said to him, I said, realize that the seller knows everything about that business. You don't know anything about the business except what he shows you. Um, those people that can tell you the most about the business are the ones that you can't talk to. <laughs> so, so I would really, really encourage you. He never did. He closed on the business. Uh, three months later, it went to hell. The whole business just went to hell. Um, because those workers were the ones that could have told him the difficulty that there is in finding people who have that type of skill to achieve that particular type of business. And he didn't have that type of skill. So he couldn't go in, number one, he couldn't do it. And number two, he didn't have the skill to be able to train anybody. So he found himself without any workforce whatsoever in less than a month. Wow. 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 I mean, but that's a great piece of advice when buying a business um, and, and talk to the workers. And obviously you've run a lot of businesses and I know we're kind of meandering here. It's just, it always it brings up a lot of great questions. Uh, but how do you make sure that you have that solid business inside? Because you've obviously grown several businesses that you have that solid business that you could sell with, well, with those workers. Yeah. So, I mean, now again, whether I'm, it's, whether it's myself or somebody else, but you know, um, I always make the recommendation to business to to business clients, and even when I'm doing lectures, you know, you mentioned that I had talked to God knows, I don't know, 5,500 presentations or something. Wow. <laughs> and so to different types of groups of people, um, and I always make the recommendation that if you're going to get involved in a business, uh, you sneak yourself into it. Um, when I wanted to get involved in senior living, I debated with myself for a year. Um, a year. I mean, I really wanted to do it. And I debated for a year. It's like, what the hell do I know about senior living? I mean, what do I know about healthcare? Um, and so, you know, then it was like, no, I'm not going to do this, but I really want to do it. And I'm not going to do it. And so I said, okay, so let me just, let me just in chat it. So I started subscribing to every publication I could read in the senior living space. Uh, I started to identify where all the workshops were and where all the conferences and conventions were. I started going to them. I started to identify some locals who were in the business that I could talk to. Um, so what you do, if you wanna get into a business, whether it's buying a business from somebody else or starting a business from scratch, it's steep yourself in the business. Just steep yourself in the industry so that you have an understanding of what the mechanics are of how to operate and where the pitfalls are. And, uh, and you'll learn a ton and it's going to be on somebody else's dime. Great, great advice. And so speaking of industries, you're, I mean, back to, you're the fact that you have a law practice. 
Um, you know, tell me where you see the practice of, from a business standpoint, where you see the practice of the law going now that, you know, everything's changing and, you know, we've got zoom cats on lawyers, on zoom cats on, <laughs> you know, I mentioned that I had moved down to winter park, um, in November had nothing to do with COVID. Uh, I went from the 16th floor. I've always been on one of the upteenth floors in downtown Orlando, my entire adult life. Um, and so I, I end up in November of last year setting up this office on the ground floor uh, of the corner of uh, you know New York and Morris in downtown Winter Park. It's ground floor. I haven't been in an elevator since uh, I came here. Um, and just very shortly thereafter, even before COVID, I discovered Zoom. Um, since moving into this office, I have not worn a tie uh, <laughs> as a lawyer, you know, which was like standard uniform for a lawyer, was wearing a tie. And, um, and then, of course, once COVID hit in March, um, you know, I, I haven't had uh, an in-office appointment. It's all been by Zoom. So yeah, there's a there's a huge uh, uh, a huge shift in law practice because of that. Um, you know, my clientele is really pretty much all across the country, and you know, half of the time we're just talking, and we you know we'll talk about the weather outside, and you know, this guy could be in uh, Buffalo, and she could be in Maine, and uh, somebody else could be in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and um, so it's. It's that type of disbursement, but it's incredibly efficient, very efficient. You know, my client doesn't have to drive downtown, doesn't have to come here. Uh, we get it done. Everything is by email, um, electronic document uh, transmittal, uh, and so forth. So all of that, uh, in terms of the actual practice of law, um, I don't really know where it's going. Um, I do know that COVID has had an influence only because it's shut down the court systems. Um, but I don't know if that's not going to be returning after the court systems are open. Yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely changing. I mean, the court systems needed to change. They were antiquated. I mean, it's a waste of everyone's time and, you know, and driving all over God's green earth for a 10 minute court hearing. Yeah, exactly. And parking, you have to find a parking place and all and, that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and security issues. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'm interested to see where it goes. Uh, well, this has been awesome. I, you know, I did go look at your YouTube channel and I did see some cooking videos on there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm only, I'm gonna finish up with what's, what is your favorite dish to cook or eat? Or is it the same thing? No, not, not, not let's say favorite is kind of tough. You know, I, yeah. I, you know, I, so I make my own sauces. So you have some cooking videos I made. I think I did a video on Milanese. I did a, a, a one on alla vodka, and I did one on bolognese, which is the meat sauce. So I did those three videos. I did a video on a stromboli. So I love stromboli. Mm. Everybody loves stromboli as an appetizer. So I, you know, when I make all of this stuff, I make them and freeze them and all that. So I always have them available. So, so all of that is great, but I would say probably when it comes right down to what would be my favorite out of where, where I would actually put the sauce, it would really be the lasagna. Um, I, I think that, you know, I do, I do a pretty good lasagna because I do the, the authentic Maria Pino lasagna, which is the little meatballs, the tiny little meatballs that you roll up and, you know, you put in there. And um, so it's a, it's a pretty good lasagna. So the recipe of that for that is in there also. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna have to check that out. My wife loves lasagna. So we're gonna have to, <laughs> we'll have to look, look that up and, uh, and put some in there. But Larry, this has been fantastic. If anyone, uh, if anyone wants to follow you, what's the best place to follow you and pay attention and see what you're doing? So I have a, a blog, which is called our life in business. Um, and so our life in business.com. So I blog in there certainly weekly, you know, I write for the Orlando Sentinel. So I, I have my poster in there. Um, the more extensive articles that I've got, I, I put in Medium. So it's medium.com. Nice. Um, and um, so any of those sort of essay type of articles, they could go to medium.com for that. And then I also just have, if you want to just sort of have a central hub, um, the Larry, LarryPino.com. Awesome. Uh, is, a, is a central hub and 
any one of those has a way to reach me if they want to reach me. Fantastic. Well, Larry, thank you so much for being on the show. I, I loved it. And thanks so much for the call and the opportunity to get on. Yeah, and thank you all. And thank you all for paying attention, Larry and I, and uh, listening to us. Make sure to give him a shout out on social media and follow him. And, and if you do one of his recipes, let him know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this has been Iron Garlic and the Garlic Marketing Show. <laughs>